histones and molecular clocks. Um, first, we'll talk about histones themselves a little bit. They're a very unusual group of proteins. Um, basically, what they are is they are proteins around which DNA is wrapped. Uh, the DNA in uh, a single chromosome in a human body is probably a millimeter across. Well, you can't fit that into a nucleus. So it is wrapped around histones. And then it is supercoiled and a bunch of other things so that it's all compacted together. Sort of like taking the words that would be in a long string and folding them first onto pages and then the pages into a book. So you have a book that's perhaps as big that if you were to string the words out would be miles long. Uh, <clears throat> and it's much more convenient to have the book in your library than those strings of words, obviously. Um, the, uh, most of what I've gotten, I think, came from Cornelius Hunter. I'm not quite sure. This is the website, although I did look around some of it on my own, and I did read the original uh, literature, as you will, I think, see. Um, First of all, to uh, give you a little insight into the problem that we're going to be looking at, um, this is a fairly standard um, uh, cell biology textbook, Essential Cell Biology, second edition, Alberts B. et al., 2004. And uh, the histones that form these little rings that we've just uh, introduced you to, the form of the nucleosome core are among the most highly conserved of all known eukaryotic proteins. There are only two differences between the amino acid sequence of histone H4 from peas and cows, about as divergent as you can get, for example. Uh, recently, histones have been found in archaea, prokaryotes that form a phylogenetic kingdom distinct from eukaryotes and eubacteria. This extreme evolutionary conservation reflects the vital structural role of histones in forming chromatin. So histones are just, they're there. And, um, uh, yes? Yeah, but how long is the uh, histone molecule? Oh, it's uh, nanometers across. Uh, it's, it's about 100 nanometers, so, if I remember sorry, correctly. Sorry, number of bases. So it's what? N number of bases. Yeah. Oh, um, well, uh, actually, it's an octamer, uh, which uh, there's two of histone 2A, two of histone 2B, two of histone 3, and two of histone 4 all glommed together. And, um, and each one of those is about 100 amino acids. If I remember right, histone H4 is about 102 amino acids. We'll see that in passing as we go through. So there's about 800 amino acids total. Go ahead, try it. Can you explain that just, just a little more? Uh, a little more. Because I, I don't know, I've never heard these terms before to use and explain it to him. Well, well okay. I know the terms. But. Histones are kind of a roughly disc-shaped um, uh, molecule that's made of eight parts. Okay, and the DNA is wound around the outside of it. There's a picture here if you look at it very carefully. Yeah, that, is uh, that where the, you uh, see the DNA gray? wrapped around and the histones yeah. in the middle. Yeah. Okay. That's what I figured. So that gives you kind of a kind of an idea of what we're talking about. There's 142 base pairs if you go all the way around two loops of this thing. Um, the amino acid sequence of four histones, those are H2A, H2B, H3, and H4, are remarkably similar among distantly related species. For example, the sequences of histone H3 from sea urchin tissue and calf thymus differ by only a single, that should be a single, although that's the way it came out, uh, amino acid, and H3 from a garden pea and calf thymus differ in only four amino acids. The similarity in sequence among histidines from all eukaryotes suggests that they fold into very similar three 
dimensional conformations which were optimized for histone function early in evolution in a common ancestor of all modern eukaryotes. So, I mean, this is very similar, so obviously it had to come from the same DNA. Well, otherwise you'd have to invent it all over again. And that's prohibitively too accurate. I mean, you've heard about you know, cytochrome C where maybe 40% of the amino acids can be different without, uh, without ruining the molecule. Um, and some of them are even worse than that, uh, or more, more diverse than that. But in this case, we're talking maybe two, maybe four in some cases. Maybe one all the way from sea urchins to uh, garden peas, or cathimus to garden peas, excuse me. Now, for what it's worth, these underlined ones here, this is the fifth edition of Lodish. And the fourth edition of Lodish has, says almost exactly the same thing, except that it's a little more specific in the fifth edition, as far as I can tell. Alberts uh, uh, wrote another text, Molecular Biology of the Cell. I'm not sure why the two different texts, but I guess he's big enough that that's what happens if you're that good an editor. And uh, this was in 1994. This is the third edition, and commented... Changes in amino acid sequences are evidently much more harmful for some proteins than others. Virtually all amino acid changes are harmful in hist histone H4. We assume that individuals who carried such harmful mutations have been eliminated from the pro uh, population by natural selection. Well, you see, it has to be because if there's a whole bunch of different histones that really could work, then you'd expect for random mutations to kind of find those ones and put them in particular animals. But in fact, that's not what we're finding. So it must be demanded by natural selection, right? I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead. Uh, one, th one of the things I'm interested in, even though there's what appears to be slight variation there, uh, what about the DNA is wrapped around it? Well, the DNA can be any DNA. That's one of the beauties of histones. Yeah, so that's going to vary. That's going to vary. Yeah. Exactly. Um, that's why, see, histones are so useful is because you can wrap this DNA and then that DNA and then yeah. the other DNA around them, and it still works. And, of course, that means that it probably has to be a little more specific histones. Yeah, it's just like um, we're all made out of bone material, but... Uh, so... Let's come back to molecular biology of the cell. This is the fourth edition. We just read from the third edition, and the fourth edition doesn't have that precise passage, but it does have another passage that's related. Apparently, they took that passage and kind of dissolved it and put it in this other place. And when they reconstituted, it wasn't exactly the same. As might be expected from their fundamental role in DNA packaging, the histones are among the high, most highly conserved eukaryotic proteins. For example, the amino acid sequence of histone H4 from a pea and a cow differ at only two of the 102 positions. This strong evolutionary conservation suggests that the functions of histones involve nearly all of their amino acids so that a change in any position is deleterious to the cell. Yes? What about the uh, bases that allow substitution that do not affect the amino acids? Have they looked at that picture? Do though, or is it that consistent? It's that consistent. Well, we're going to come to it uh, where you're going to see an okay. actual quote from somebody who studied it and found only one amino acid difference, and it was what we call a conservative substitution. So we're going to, we're going to come to that. This suggestion has been tested. There's the suggestion, let's um, go back to that. Um, this strong evolutionary conservation suggests that the functions of the histones involve nearly all their amino acids so that a change in any position is deleterious to the cell. Okay, that's the, I mean, because otherwise it wouldn't be all identical, right? Uh, this suggestion that everything has to be identical because otherwise it will be defective has been tested directly in yeast cells in which it is possible to mutate a given histone gene in vitro and introduce it into the yeast genome in place of the normal gene. As might be expected, most changes in histone sequences are lethal. The few that are not lethal cause changes in the normal pa pattern of gene expression as well as other abnormalities. So if they're not lethal, they're at least they make the 
organisms sicker, and so they can't compete in the uh, uh, race of life. So that's, that is still what the textbook says. Now we're going to go and look at um, an, a little article that is very little known, but is, is fascinating. Is it true that histones have only a very narrow range of acceptable changes? Well, <clears throat> to answer that, we're going to look at an article by S. Agarwal and Behe, M.J., 1996. Now, some of you may perk up at that last name. Yes, indeed, it is Michael J. Behe. Uh, and to put this in historical perspective, this was published at just about the same time as his book, Darwin's Black Box, came out. So he's thinking in kind of those terms, but he's not actually put himself out yet, uh, as in, in uh, at least when he's starting the research. Non-conservative mutations are well tolerated in the globular region of yeast histone H4. Wait a minute. I thought they weren't tolerated. Well, let's take a look at what he said. Okay, and you can actually look this up on your own. Um, and the abstract goes, yeast histone H4 has been mutagenized, made, made to mutate, at several positions which participate in the globular core of the nucleosome. The native protein contains residues at those positions which are invariant or highly conserved over all known H4 sequences, whether from yeast, tetrahymena, or higher eukaryotes. Nonetheless, the protein is intolerant of non-conservative mutations. Tolerant. What? Tolerant. Uh, uh, nonetheless, is tolerant. I'm sorry, did I say intolerant? I'm sorry. Nonetheless, the protein is tolerant of non-conservative mutations. At the level of cell function, the, the mutant proteins cause no significant change in the length of the cell cycle of mating efficiency. At the level of chromatin structure, no effect is observed on the internucleosomal spacing of chromatin or the pattern of hydroxyl radical cleavage of nucleosomal DNA. Wait. That sounds like it doesn't really matter. Well, what's the evidence for that? Well, let's, um, let's go through the article and just briefly and see. I won't read the whole thing, of course, but um, I, I did. Um, different classes of proteins are conserved to different extents along species, with some proteins varying minimally and others being barely recognizable from their sequences. Some of the best examples of the former category are the histones H2A, H2B, H3, and H4, which complex with DNA to form the nucleosome, the fundamental nucleoprotein structure of all eukaryotic uh, genomes. And um, goes on, the architecture of the nucleosome, as well as its protein and DNA comp composition, appear to be highly conserved in all eukaryotes. The amino acid sequences of the histones are themselves highly conserved, H2A and H2B very little between species. And histones H3 and H4 vary practically, not at all. Of the 102 amino acid residues in the sequence of H4, so there's your 102, only one position differs between the protein of calf and the protein of sea urchin, and that is a conservative substitution. Well, I was not able to get hold of Van Hold, but I went through and looked at uh, other articles that might uh, give me that answer, and I found Wooters Taru et al. 1976 in FABS letters, um, and, uh, <clears throat> and I'll just give you one little quote of that, which gives you the kind of the meat of it, uh, besides that they had the sequence, the whole sequence, so you could read it. Uh, the residue of cysteine was identified at position 73 in place of the residue of threonine, as found in calf histone H4. Uh, cysteine has the standard amino, which is a CH2SH. Uh, threonine has a CHOH and then another methyl group on the end of that. So for practical purposes, they are very similar. They're not exactly the same, but that is what you would call a conservative substitution most of the time. 
The only place it wouldn't be really conservative would be, let's say, if it was in the heart of, a, uh, of an enzyme that needed a hydroxyl radical in a particular place or needed a sulfhydryl radical in a certain particular place. But if it's sitting out in water, that's pretty conservative. It's kind of medium. It's not really hydrophobic, but it's not really hydrophilic. So that's a conservative replacement. The H4 sequences of unicellular eukaryotes can differ somewhat more than this. Um, the sequence of yeast H4 has eight conservative uh, differences with calf H4, and an analogous protein from tetrahymena has 23 differences, some of which are non-conservative, including deletions of one residue and the insertion of another. So apparently you can make uh, H4 with quite a few differences. According to this, 23 differences from tetrahymena. Um, the, cons the extreme cons conservation of the sequence of histone H4 across vast phylogenetic distances led to the assumption that virtually no residue could be altered without causing the protein to, be to become non-functional. This view was rationalized by the central role of histones in the expression of eukaryotic genetic information and the fact, of course, that they're all almost identical in real organisms. However, experiments tended to contradict such a view. Oh, in the 1970s it was shown that the amino terminal tails of the histones could be removed by protease digestion with no effect on the organization of the DNA in the residual nucleosome. You just cut those tails off, don't matter. This result was rationalized by presuming that the histone fragments were, that were unnecessary for the maintenance of nucleosome structure would have another role to play in the cell, perhaps in the establishment of internucleosomal contacts or in the interaction with non-nucleosomal proteins. Somewhat later, it was shown by Kleinschmidt and Martinson that histone tyrosine residuals that are conserved across all species could be iodinated. We could stick iodine on that tyrosine. It does very well because tyrosine is a, got a phenol at the end of it, and phenols are very easy to iodinate. Okay, so we stick these huge, big iodine blobs on the tyrosine. Um, and the modified proteins used to reconstitute nucleosomes with structures indistinguishable from native particles. It was even shown that several of the modified nucleosomes had stabilities as measured by melting temperatures that were identical to those of the parent structures. So they can't really tell the difference between the iodinated stuff and the regular stuff. It seems to work just fine. This is quite unexpected in the view of the structural insult that the bulky iodine item would be. Hypotheses about the involvement of the tyrosine residues in other cell functions were difficult to formulate because evidence indicated that these residues were all buried in the globular interior of the nucleosome and presumably unavailable for other roles. So you just, you know, put a little iodine on here or there, it doesn't matter. In 1988, the research group of Michael Grunstein, in a search for an unknown function of histones, demonstrated that the amino terminal 28 residues of H4 could be deleted in yeast and the cell still grew. Just lop off a whole 28 amino acids, didn't matter. Cells containing the largest deletions grew more slowly than the wild type and were deficient in mating function. So maybe there is an evolutionary disadvantage if you just cut off the whole thing, but maybe if you take two or three, it won't, won't really matter. Um, however, cells containing in de uh, deletions in the amino terminus up to residue 14, however, showed no phenotypic changes. The doubling time, that's how fast they'll grow, and the mating efficiency time, or mating efficiency, were the same as wild type. So they grow fine, they mate fine. What's the difference? So why don't we find those particular mutations in yeast? Earlier, and the same research group had shown quite elastic behavior in the tail regions of the less conserved H2A and H2B of yeast. 
The tails of either protein, but not both, could be deleted or switched with each other. And no phenotypic results were observed. So it looks like you can do a bunch of stuff to it, and it still works. Similar results for H4 were reported by McGee et al. In, instead of deletions, they introduced site-specific changes in lysine residues in the amino terminal regions of histone H4. It's changing one or two lysine residues, residues in this region at a time to arginine res residues gave, again, no phenotypic results. Even though the lysine residues are conserved in all species, in other words, they aren't arginine, they're lysine, from yeast to human. Now, to give a little perspective on this, arginine and lysine are coded for by relatively different codes. So it would be hard to mutate from ar uh, lysine to arginine. But lysine and arginine are both basic amino acids with a tail in this little, e either amino in one case or guanidino in the other case, uh, but, but positively charged side group. Uh, so that, that's considered a conservative mutation. So apparently you can change one lysine, doesn't matter, two lysines, doesn't matter. You get four, maybe you're starting to get a problem. Um, changing four lysine residues at a time to non-charged glutamine, which now doesn't have that positive charge and might be important because remember the DNA is negatively charged. Um, uh, residues destroyed mating function, increased doubling time somewhat. So yeah, now we're not we're not doing so well. But you know, you change it to arginine, it doesn't matter too much. Um, glutamine is neutral for what it's worth. The region of a, a histone H4 that Cain et al. and McGee et al. modified is a non-globular region. That is to say, instead of being all wound up in this nice little fitting area, uh, technically we're talking about what's roughly referred to as a ball, although it's, it's more like a pie shape than a ball, but uh, whatever. Um, it's a non-globular region. It's this little tail is sticking out okay, that doesn't have to be in a ball. Thought to be involved in internuclear somal contacts, and perhaps the regulation of some genes in some species. And it turns out that's the case. Those tails can be acetylated, they can be methylated, they, are, they can be trimethylated lysine, they can do all kinds of things to them. And uh, when they do that, uh, it changes how the, um, uh, how the histone packages the protein it, or packages the DNA. In other words, in some cases it makes it more accessible to translation, in some cases it makes it less. That's epigenetics for those of you who remember some of those other talks. Um, deletions in the globular region of H4 were shown to be, to be lethal. You can't take an amino acid out and hope that it'll work. This left open the question of whether the globular region was substantially less tolerant of change than the non-globular tails due to the more exacting structural requirements. Enter their experiment. We report here, this is B, Agrawal and Behe, a study of substitutions in the globular regions of histone H4 at several residues which are identical or highly conserved in H4 sequences throughout the eukaryotic kingdom. We show that the residues can tolerate non-conservative substitutions and still permit viability in yeasts that are dependent on the muta mutant protein. None of the mutations exhibit any significant effect on the duration of the cell cycle, mating efficiency, or chromatin or nucleosome structure. These results show that chromatin structure is amenable to investigation by the powerful twos of mutagenesis. And that's where they finish, but the, it also shows that the structure can be modified considerably and the creatures still live quite nicely. Thank you very much. And here's the results. Uh, well, I'm not going to read the whole thing, of course, but uh, non-conservative mutations in H4 are compatible with cell viability. Yeast strain UKY403 was constructed by Grunstein's research group. Uh, you're going to ask, how did they do this in 1996? Well, they got a special yeast that would stop making histones when it got glucose-poor solution. And so 
they, it had the genomic copies of the histone H4 disrupted, and it was dependent on expression of a plasmid-borne H4 gene. The H4 gene that is carried in the UKY403 by plasmid PKU421 is under the control of a GAL1 promoter and therefore can be switched off in media containing glucose. So you add glucose and that wipes out that. So the histones first are knocked out in the, in the main part of the genome. And then there's a little plasmid that does well as long as you don't have too much glucose and puts out histones and that will allow the yeast to grow. But now what they're doing is they're taking that plasmid, if you give them glucose, suddenly it won't make histones anymore and the thing will not divide. If it tries, it'll die. So the strategy of the glucose shift assay is to introduce into UKY403 a second plasmid called PYES 1.4, pardon me, 2-1.4, which is a plasmid that contains a mutated copy of H4 that they decided which mutation it was going to be and made it that way with a constitutive promoter and to shift the transformed cells into glucose media. Now it produces both the regular histones and these defective, if you want to call it that, histones. Okay. Um, then the native H4 gene carried on PKU is then switched off and you see whether the cell can survive, whether it can only cells containing genes on PYES 1.4 that code for mutated but functional H4 will survive. So now you get to see which ones will actually make it. Okay, so that's the technique. And it's really imaginative if you think about it from way back 1996 before we could make DNA at will, or at least make it easily at will. Isolation of mRNA from surviving yeast colonies and sequencing of polymerase chain reaction amplified um, mRNA H4 transcripts confirmed the presence of the expected mutations in the absence of the native H4 sequence. In other words, they wanted to make sure that it wasn't just that those particular ones were growing on their regular uh, H4. So what they did was once they got them growing, they would do PCR and find out what mRNA is in there and they find out that, lo and behold, it was the one that they had put in and mutated and not the normal type. So they are actually living off of this mutated H4. And to skip down of why, and I'm going to show you the, uh, the, the results in the table. And you can see here's the normal one, isoleucine tyrene and the uh, glutamic acid. This is a positive acid. Uh, positively charged. This is a hydrophobic one for those of you who uh, remember your biochemistry. And this is a tyrosine, by the way. This is the tyrosine that could be, uh, one of the tyrosines that could be iodinated with no effect. Um, that's why they picked the positions 50 to 52 to modify. And you can see that here's one with the, the, with the, the ones with the normal and um, the cell cycle is 97 minutes in this particular case, and uh, the mating efficiency is arbitrarily set at one. And you could do alanine, tyranine, and methionine in those positions, and here the cell cycle in minutes is prolonged. So they don't multiply quite as fast, uh, and it's probably statistically significantly different. I'd have to do the math, but uh, um, didn't do it. And here, it's clearly statistically significantly different. They don't mate very well. What's mating efficiency? Mating efficiency means the probability of being able to mate with uh, another, uh, uh, another yeast uh, at, a, at any given time. And um, uh, here's, uh, they had lysine and they 59. If you want more detail, you probably can look at the article itself as to exactly how they figured that out. Um, but here again, uh, you can see that um, this is, the, this is the, normal, the normal type. Lysine is supposed to be there. But you can put glutamine, which is an entirely different amino acid. Um, and um, the cell cycle is somewhat prolonged, although this 
standard deviation is quite, quite large, and these are probably not statistically significantly different. Um, uh, pardon me, 133. Actually, it multiplies a little bit faster, although it's not statistically significant. And it, it mates with less efficiency, and that probably is statistically significant. But here's a couple of them that multiply faster and, don't, uh, and mate close enough to the original that you can't really tell the difference. Um, you can put arginine in there, which no, not surprising there, but isoleucine? Isoleucine is a totally hydrophobic. I mean, that's as far away from our, uh, lysine as you can get. Um, glutamine is kind of so-so. Um, valine is, again, totally... Valine and isoleucine are very close to each other. Um, Alanine, which is only a methyl group out to one side. Glycine, which is only a hydrogen atom, will still work. Leucine, which is kind of like isoleucine in terms of its hydrophobicity, just uh, not as much towards the center, but more of a tail. Um, again, you know, not too bad. They're all slightly diff deficient in mating efficiency, but a couple of them, you couldn't really say for sure that they were... Uh, that they were different statistically, and th they multiply faster, so that should give them a, an advantage. And look at this. This is 133 and 126, 127, 127, 131. Every single one of these, except for the alanine one, multiplies faster, although, again, probably not statistically significant, but then if you're going to require that, you have to discount this as well. So, and... Uh, in their discussion, they're going to talk about protein structure. The X-ray crystallographic studies, beam X-ray at them and, uh, and see where the X-rays go and calculate where the crystal, what the crystal has to look like to produce that X-ray diffraction picture. Of the histone octamer, have shown that H4 has a long central alpha helix comprising residues 50 to 74. And remember, we're talking about 50 to 52 and 99. Uh, uh, pardon me, in 59. Figure 5 shows a helical wheel projection, we're going to look at that in a minute, of the portion of the helix containing the residues mutated in this study. It is seen that the charged residues, glu uh, glutamic acid 52, arginine 55, that's basic, this is acid of course, lysine 59, basic also, and glu uh, glutamine 63, appear on one side of the helix while hydrophobic re residues predominate on the other side suggesting that that's on the inside and the other ones are on the outside. Thus, the side chain of isoleucine 50 is very likely to be buried in the side chains of glutamic acid or 52 and lysine 59 are likely to point outward. Such amphifacility amphi well, is a strong indication that the hydrophilic... Blame the Greeks for that one. Um, the hydrophilic face is on the inside area, the water-loving face of the structure, and the hydrophobic, the water-avoiding uh, fa residues, face the interior, which is usually true. And here's that structure that I promised you. You notice that I-50 starts here, isoleucine 50. This is the tyrosine. That's the one that gets um, uh, the uh, uh, iodine on it, and it doesn't matter. Here is the... Uh, glutamic acid 52. They ran out of, the G was already taken for glycine, that's why it's E. Um, and, um, and then the, the, you're looking down the helix, so up a few rows is the uh, lysine 59. Again, they ran out of L because it's leucine had already taken it, so that's, that's why it's K. Um, and uh, See, E53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59. And if you notice, if you look at this, this is arginine, glutamic acid, glutamic acid, lysine, uh, arg uh, pardon me, arginine here. This is uh, actually alanine. So this group right here is probably uh, the outside. And this one that has valine, isoleucine, Phenylalanine, valine, uh, leucine, 
these are all hydrophilic, so those probably belong in the inside. And serine is kind of halfway in between. Glutamic acid is kind of more of an outside. Uh, serine again. And uh, so you're looking at something that likes to stick to uh, things that are not water. Namely, among other things, other uh, amino acids that have those same kind of chains uh, will tend to form together, sort of like soap bubbles that have the, the water-loving heads on the outside and the, and the, um, and the uh, hydrophobic, uh, the water-avoiding uh, heads on the inside where they can interact with each other. We decided to examine first codons 50 to 52 for several reasons. One, examining three codons at a time might allow combinations of a sequence that would not be allowed individually. So maybe you try one or two and it doesn't work, but if you switch two of them at the same time, it'll work then. Uh, two, an examination of these residues would include both hydrophobic and hydrophilic faces of the helix. It would go most of the way around that helix. Um, three, residues of 50 to 52 are highly conserved across all species with just a single variant known. An aspartic acid residue occurs at position 52 in tetrahymena instead of a glutamic acid residue. So they were hoping at least we'd get aspartic acid to be able to be in 52. Well, in several attempts, we were only able to isolate the double mutant alanine, tyrosine, methionine uh, at positions 50 to 52. No mutations were seen for tyrosine 51, even though that residue can be iodinated in vitro to give nucleosomes that are very similar to native nucleosomes. At position 52, we expected to be able to isolate a mutation to an aspartic acid residue, since tetrahydramina H4 has that in that position, but the mutation did not occur. Um, Maybe if they deliberately designed it, it might have worked. Uh, it sounds like they mutated and hoped, and uh, the only one that showed up is a double, which switched it weirdly. We chose to examine lysine 59 because it is in the same helix as residues 50 to 52 and is likely to be a surface residue. Mutagenesis at the single position produced a number of viable substitutions. As shown in Table 1, 8 of 12 possible amino acid residues are tolerated at position 59. 8 of 12 possible amino acids. Now, actually, it's, uh, there's 20. They just didn't test all 20 because they were only able to get it to mutate to, to uh, 12 different ones. And, uh, and, of course, four of them didn't work. So, um, Such tolerance to substitution is similar to the surface residues of prokaryotic proteins studied by mutagenesis that are not critical for protein function. In other words, this is what you'd expect for, say, cytochrome C or um, collagen or a number of other things. If it's sticking out on the outside, you kind of expect it not to matter quite so much. Um, the conclusion that the mutations we've isolated are well tolerated rests not only on functional studies of cell doubling time and mating efficiency, which means these cells grew. Uh, it's not fatal but also on detailed studies of chromatin and nucleosome structure. The things look the same. Figures 3 and 4 show that to the limits of the ability of the assay to detect, chromatin structure remains unchanged to the action of micrococcal nucleus or hydroxyl radical for any of the substitutions we've isolated. Behave the same under certain kinds of stress that they tried. Um, hydroxyl radical tends to attack outside um, uh, amino acids. Uh, conservation of sequence. The sequences of histone H, histones H4 are known for a large number of organisms ranging from yeast to human, from coral to tomato. These represent species whose last common ancestor is thought to have existed approximately two billion years ago, and whose disparate evolutions have twisted and turned through many separate routes. In the cells of these organisms, the chromatin repeat distance ranges from 160 to 240 base pairs. The genome size differs more than a thousand fold, and some lack any identifiable H1. The number of copies of the H4 gene ranges from two to several hundred, etc. Uh, in fact, 
in many organisms, there will be multiple copies of H2 because they need so much of it that they basically, they just printed the instructions three or four times. So it's a little easier than if you just printed it in one and hoped that it would really um, produce a lot of mRNA. It also gives you spare copies in case one of them gets damaged. In short, they greatly differ from each other in many traits affecting functioning of the genome. Nevertheless, in every eukaryotic species, the positions of the H4 sequence that con con correspond to regions positions 50, 52 and 59 in yeast are identical, with a single exception of ASP52 in het uh, tetrahymena. Remember, ASP instead of glu, glu is aspartic acid instead of glutamic acid. Both of them acids, one of them has a, a lengthened side chain of a CH2, the glutamic acid, compared to the aspartic acid, which is a little shorter. That's the only difference. That is a very conservative uh, replacement. This conservation occurs despite the flat fact, as shown in this paper, that experimentally introduced mutations at these positions cause no detectable changes in chromatin structure or yeast viability. Over the last several decades, the framework for explaining such questions has been the molecular clock hypothesis. Simply stated, the molecular clock hypothesis posits the fixation of random mutations in the genome of all species at a rate which is constant with respect to time. However, it was noticed very early that when the number of amino acid differences is normalized for protein length, separate protein classes, for example, fibrinopeptides, which really rapidly change from species to species, cytochrome C, which changes a little less, myoglobins, which changes a little more than uh, cytochrome C, and histones, which of course are the most conservative at all, diverge by varying amounts. And I just gave you some of the uh, divergences there. Thus, the percentage sequence of difference for myoglobins from different species is always greater than their cytochrome Cs. So the cytochrome C clock doesn't tick quite as fast as the myoglobin clock if you're thinking at it, about it from an evolutionary standpoint. The need to accommodate differing species variations in separate classes of proteins added a caveat to the clock hypothesis, the postulate of functional constraints. By this, it is meant that, for example, a histone H4 would diverge less rapidly than fibrinopeptides if a larger percentage of H4 amino acid residues were critical for the function of the molecules, whereas the fibrinopeptides could be whatever. It doesn't really matter. See, the reason that you have this conservation is because you can't change it. If you do, it won't, it won't work. The, the organism will die or at least will fall behind uh, in reproduction. From the work reported here, it seems that the constraints on positions 50, 52, and 59 do not directly concern chromatin structure or the general housekeeping functions that are necessary for growth under laboratory conditions. Doesn't, they don't really matter. If they were critical for the maintenance of chromatin structure, then changes in these positions would be expected to be non-viable, which they're not. Uh, now, but that was Michael Behe, and you know he has no credibility. In fact, I was stunned to find out that he, Agrawal's in his article, uh, according to Google, a uh, scholar anyway, has never been cited since 1976. Why is that? Well, so you don't believe uh, Agarwal and Behe? Well, let's see what we have here. Dij et al. in 2008 in Cell. Probing nucleosome function, a highly versatile library of synthetic H, histone H3 and H4 mutants. And uh, I was able to obtain guest access. I'm not sure how, what you have to do to do that, whether you have to be a member of the library or whether that's just uh, that's open to anybody who signs up. I'm not sure, but whatever, you can get to it. Um, nucleosomal structural integrity underlies the regulation of DNA metabolism and transcription. Using a synthetic approach, a versatile library of 486 systemic histone H3 and H4 substitution and deletion mutants, ooh, they've been playing with the whole molecule, that probes the contribution of each residue to nucleosome function, 
was generated in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. That's yeast. We probed fitness contributions of each residue to perturbations of chromosome integrity and transcription, mapping global patterns of chemical sensitivities and requirements for transcriptional silencing onto the nuclear, nucleosome surface. Each histone mutant was tagged with unique molecular barcodes, facilitating identification of histone mutant pools through the barcode amplification labeling and TAG microarray hybridization. Barcodes were used to score complex phenotypes such as competitive fitness in a chemostat, DNA repair proficiency and synthetic genetic interactions, revealing new functions for distinct histone residues and new interdependencies among nucleosome components and their modifiers. They're playing with this stuff. It can be played with and the, and the organisms don't die. In fact, um, and I'm going to be much briefer with this article because we've been over a lot of the background. It is remarkable how many residues in these highly conserved proteins can be mutated and retain basic nucleosomal function. Who knew? For the most part, the list of inviable mutational mutations, excuse me, the list of inviable mutations agreed in the two strain backgrounds. There were some that didn't work in two strains. With some notable exceptions, and in a few cases, a lethal mutant in one strain background was sick in the other. So it didn't grow very well in one, but it didn't grow at all in another, or vice versa. But in most cases, mutations causing lethality in one background supported near normal growth in the other. So it depended on the strain whether it could be tolerated or not. These discrepant results between strain backgrounds help explain earlier reports of phenotypic discrepancies in the literature. Apparently, whether you can uh, mutate a particular uh, amino acid in H4 is dependent on whether you're, um, on what organism you're dealing with, and in some cases, what strain of yeast you're talking about. It has previously been shown that glucose limited's chemostat experiments extending over 20 generations select for fitter genetic variants. That makes sense. You know, you just grow them and see which ones grow faster. Um, providing a convenient model for adaptive evolution by natural selection. So after 10 days growth, about 30 generations, populations were sampled and amplified tags were analyzed so they would figure out, you know, which of these organisms is actually growing. Data indicate that about 40% of the viable histone mutants were reduced or eliminated in the pool. So 40% of them didn't grow very well. Surprisingly, a subset of 27 histone mutants showed a higher intensity after growth. They actually grew better than the wild type, suggesting that they're collectively fitter and maintain a selective advantage under glucose limitation. So they're better than the original. Mutants were grouped and colored based on their day 10 abundance. Figure 5D shows the most mutants are reduced in the population after 20 days. Most of these that thrive after 20 days were already abundant at day 10. Thus, these strains exhibit a fit fitness advantage over the other mutants. Indeed, 8 out of the 27 uh, 10 day, day 10 winners still dominate the population at day 20. So they're growing and growing and growing, and it doesn't seem to make any difference. They do just fine on mutant histones. Anyway, so the answer is no, you can grow these things with different histones. So why is everything virtually identical? Well, histones themselves uh, leave advocates of unguided evolution with a dilemma. You can choose door number A. Either there are almost no invi uh, viable alternative sequences, in which case it's not easy to imagine unguided evolution hitting upon the exact solution necessary. You know, the claim that's always been made is, oh, you can do whatever you want to, you know, there's a wide variety of, then why did we hit on the precise histone sequence with one or two changes all the way from peas to cows? Or, so that sounds like if it has to be exact, in which case, 
how in the world did you ever get there? You have to be 100% there before it works. Or there are multiple viable alternative sequences, in which case it is difficult to understand why virtually all organisms have the same protein sequence, unless that was the original design. And God just didn't bother to change that particular part, even though he could have. Could you argue that there hasn't been that much time for this? Well, that's one of the things that I think you'd have to argue. Because if God put it in, and he could have chosen otherwise, then you give it enough time and it would have spread to some of those other ones anyway, right? Just more mutants. So that's an argument against old age and against short age creationism. So you can, ha you can take your pick, which poison do you want? You have to hit it right on the nail, or, well, actually, you can hit a right number. We just all started out with the same, which means there hasn't been that much time, and uh, the molecular clock is a little bit of a fraud. Now, one can attempt to split the difference and, and say that in sequence space, there's this large hill, but it comes up to a very fine peak. Although we don't have any evidence for that peak, that would give the best of both worlds. You see, you have a large target area, and then once you get onto the target, you can climb up the hill. And evolution is very good at hill climbing. It's not very good at searching uh, uh, the ocean for islands. However, the experimental peak seems too broad and suggests that maybe an identical protein sequence was the starting point, and that there hasn't been that much time for randomizing the sequence. Which is really a kind of a short age proposition, isn't it? But anyway, that's my opinion now. It's your turn. We have several comments. Um, OK, uh, go ahead, and we'll come to. Mutations, as far as evolution. It's bizarre. Is you yeah. look at this and you're going, then why isn't everything so different if, if there's lots yeah, of different ways of doing it? doesn't explain any of it. Um, and this is a very strong evolutionary prediction that didn't come true. Yeah. Now, that doesn't prove evolution is wrong, but it does kind of raise some questions. It certainly doesn't help. Yeah. Uh, here and then here and then back there. Okay, go ahead. Um, this is kind of analogous to the living fossils, only on a molecular level, isn't it? Yes. It is very, very analogous to the living fossils. This is a living biochemical fossil. And it raises the question of whether that 80 million years really was there, or in this case, 2 billion years. Why would you well. preserve it if it doesn't need to be preserved? Uh, well, that's, that's the $64,000 question. <laughs> uh, here and then there and then I back to you. I just have a question that uh, I'm not sure how to ask because I don't know all the terminology. But um, that second part where you said they're all, there's very little variability. Right. A, an evolution over long periods of time would expect that cows and peas would have totally different... Well, they have totally different cytochrome yeah. Cs. So they have totally different fibrin proteins. Uh, I mean, and it, as they mutate and right, all that, and they should years, be very and different. Two, there should have been some kind okay. of change there that would have... Yeah, it's just, it heart. makes no sense mm -hmm. to say that you know, there's 40% difference in cytochrome C, and there's 1% in H4, you know, one amino acid when, I, I, I don't know what size, what size is cytochrome C? It's, it's about 150 or so, something like that. So we're talking like 60, 60 different amino acids in, in, in cytochrome, uh, and, and then that's, you know, the, the, the disparity is just breathtaking. Anyway, I pass it back and uh, we'll catch. Uh... A 
couple questions. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess I'm thinking from from the creator standpoint, it's not clear to me why a creator would choose to use the same pattern throughout species for one protein, but choose to use different patterns in different proteins. Is there, I mean, that, it seems like either you have an approach that uses one or the other. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? I do. Um, there is one possibility, and that's the remind hypothesis, that life was designed to resist um, description by evolutionary uh, means. That it's actually designed to give us evidence. In which case, it would make perfect sense for a creator mm -hmm. to say, you know what, I can do whatever <coughs> I please. If I want to make them all identical, I can do that. If I want to spread them out, I can do that. And you just kind of have to live with it. So in other words, a intentional fingerprint. Yeah. Possibly. That's a signature. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing, it seems to me as though uh, if there's an optimum, I, I think, I don't know about this, but I think histones are, they deal with DNA regardless of the DNA sequence. Correct. So they're very general. In fact, they have to be, because otherwise they would only be, you'd have to have a different histone right. for every, you know, three stretches of DNA or whatever. Um, so, I mean, I'm totally speculating here, but it seems to me as though, is it the phosphate backbone is what the histone is actually working with, that's interacting with? Pretty much. Yeah, the, the bases are all on the inside. So what you're looking at is the phosphate. And interestingly enough, in that <coughs> regard, histone proteins are rich in lysine and arginine, which are uh, basic proteins, which means that they, the DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid, remember, it's acid. Right. The acid and base tend to attract each other. Um, so and I that's guess, been noted for a long time. So I guess what I'm wondering is, is is there an optimum sequence? I mean, I think that uh, for the for the um, for the histones, and I think that's what this whole thing is all about. Right. And the answer is no. It looks um, well. Let me put it this it's way. It's kind of. There could be an optimal sequence, but there's other sequences that are not far from optimal. Exactly. So, um, so uh, yeah, I mean, this is a sort of question of ignorance, but it seems to me as though if there's an optimal sequence, then perhaps. Um, Early on, there could be um, a histone sequence that's not optimal, uh, and then with mutations, it would eventually achieve the optimal sequence. And you have about one billion years to get there, I guess. Well, it depends. If Archaea has it too, and that's one of the things I didn't see somebody actually r remark on, and so I, I can't <coughs> speak for sure on that, but apparently the Archaea uh, histones are not that much different from the standard histones in, in uh, eukaryotes. And it depends on where you diverge archaea and eukaryotes, but it may even go back further than two billion years. I, I mean, it would seem to me as though maybe for something that has a sequence of 100 per, um, per, um, his, uh, per, per protein, there, I yeah. think there's like four unique ones? 102 units, I think, for histone H4 then it seems to me as though mutations would take a inefficient histone and, and move towards um, maximum efficiency. I think a billion years would probably be enough time, wouldn't it? You mean that it started out inefficient and it mutated to the ideal in both peas and cows? Well, before peas and cows, like in, I don't know, archaea or before or whatever or, the pri primitive eukaryote was. Yeah, yeah. So in other words, uh, if you start out with an inefficient one with time, you make one slight mutation, and oh, it's, it's a little bit more efficient. It's far, far from the most efficient, but it, at least it's better than its competitors. Right. Um, but then, uh, so it seems to me as though there could be optimization to, you know, the ideal histone. Um, but I guess the... My question of ignorance is, is then why, why is there any variation of, of anything? I mean, it seems like there ought to be a most efficient protein for, well, for yeah, most Yeah, of and that's an interesting question because you can take, <coughs> apparently you can take human 
cytochrome C and take out the mouse cytochrome C and put the human in and it doesn't seem to make much difference. Yeah, so why, so why is this so why, conserved? Why is this so uniform when yeah. everything else isn't? That's the question. That's, and yeah. and I, I don't know that anybody has a good answer. And like I say, the best answer I can come up with is the remind hypothesis that God yeah, decided yeah. this is going to be his signature. He does the same histones and you can just lump it. So are, are we... Are we confident that if you have, if it turns out that the actual number, if you do enough studies, the number is 95%, um, uh, what do you call it, um, mating efficiency, that over time... That maybe that's it's really 95 and, and 95 isn't quite as good as 100%, so... So over a number of generations... Gradually you, it drops out. Yeah. Although in that case, the other question that you have is, why can't we find some yeast that have uh, glutamic acid instead of uh, lysine? You know, you'd like to, I mean, I, I suppose what we should do is do different yeast and see, you know, whether there are variations in that. Um, that would make a good research project for somebody to find out whether histone proteins intraspecies vary more than they do interspecies and if that's the case, that has very interesting implications for the molecular clock. Uh, back to Ari Roth's first question, which I'm not sure that you actually answered, um, and that is um, there are some amino acids that can be coded by different codons. Right. Um, and so is there variation in the codons? Do you know? Yeah. But, but uh, still. One of the things that I didn't put into the presentation, but is true, is that... Um, you can, uh, you can find, uh, for example, only a 97% codon identity <coughs> where there's 100% amino acid identity. So yes, there are some silent mutations that take place in the codons that don't appear in the amino acids. And the ones that have like four amino acid different will have, a, uh, at least in some one case, 85% codon identity which means 15%, um, instead of 4 out of 100, 102 or whatever it is, um, you're talking um, uh, 15, well, actually about uh, 45 uh, base difference out of 300, more or less. So if that, does that answer that question? Well, to a certain extent, but do they, have they done the sequencing of the bases yes to uh to determine uh that that variation is is due to um due to a different formula uh yeah uh, you mean uh, does a different uh, does a different uh, uh amino acids come out of a different uh base sequence yeah yeah, the, the same amino acid comes out of the... Different. Yes, yeah. the same amino acid, yeah. like I say, 3% right. difference in the... Mm. Uh, in, in one case, and again, again I hesitate no. to, to generalize and say this is the way it always is, but, but at least in the, in the examples that I saw quoted, a 3% base difference with a 0% amino acid difference. What is the which difference? Which means there, uh, out of 300 bases, you're talking nine different bases. Histones. Histone. Uh, that's histone hist mRNA versus histones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And histone DNA, which of course is okay. transcribed directly into mRNA versus histones. So there's, a, yeah, there is a, there is a variation in the, in the, uh, but, the, in the, but, the <coughs> but that the amino acid <coughs> sequence is identical in spite of the fact that it doesn't look like it has to be. Well... <laughs> I'll come back to uh, evidence for a recent creation. It hasn't changed that much yet in 6,000 years. It hasn't mutated yet. In 6,000 years. Yeah. Uh, and I think the other uh, lesson here, which is uh, one that we need to apply not just to evolutionists but to ourselves, is... Uh, the molecular, molecular clock, you know, has been used for all kinds of interpretations uh, when they talk about these uh, 
they must have existed two billion years ago. They don't have the fossil evidence for these organisms. Of course understand? not. Yeah. Uh, There's nothing before about it, uh, 540 million years ago, except uh, for uh, Ediacarian and a few algae, and that's it. I think this raises a little bit uh, higher question about the validity of molecular clocks here. When, when you some that. Well, but see, if molecular clocks are trying to measure imaginary time, then you expect them to have problems. But there's a lot of scientific papers that use the molecular clock to determine time. I bet you there are a lot of scientific papers. I know there are a lot of textbooks that will tell you that the histone has to be identical, otherwise it won't work. And yet, we make them, and the <laughs> they creatures survive. So, but you know, but you can't trust the textbooks. That's just the bottom line. Yeah. But and you can't them. even trust the you can't even trust the original papers if the original papers are building on this paper, which is building on this paper, which is building on this paper, which is actually making a false assumption. You're saying that on camera. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope some people on camera actually watch that because I think it's important for us to realize that that you know, peer review is not the end all. You know, and one of the things I hope that people will start doing is looking at, looking at stuff for themselves. Uh, somebody who looks at somebody who who looks at blast sequences otherwise and finds that to be an easy procedure should do, to do, should start lining up some of these histone, you know, uh, DNAs and histone proteins and, and, and see how many exceptions we have and what kinds they are and, and to, you know, and to then, then start drawing conclusions as to what kind of variations you can expect, what kind of variations <coughs> we have, and what implications it has for the molecular clock and for time. You'll notice that Behe, Behe is an old earth creationist, a common ancestry guy. He just thinks that it had a little help here and there. Uh, question here. I just had a thought about science that, that the, the, um, as it is function, as it functions today, science is really not accessible to the average person. You, we cannot understand it. I sit here and I don't understand. Um, when it comes to other things, we can search into them. I was just thinking about the Bible. The Bible is there and you can read it and search it and, and you can say, oh, is this person, we can compare, we can see, is he agreeing with the Bible? But when it comes to science, it seems like it's a totally different arena and I'm just thinking from the point of view of the of the average person in, out in the world mm -hmm. that's non right non or minimal bible believer they well, just so most of them just kind of go along well I, but I'm they buy tell you into something. what these great wonderful scientists are telling them it's yeah. so arcane and so erudite that it must be right yeah and that's true well, the thing of it is, people who don't know that much can sometimes say, well, you know, those are the scientists and they, maybe they have an agenda. And so uh, I don't know enough and I don't, I, I just, I just will kind of, you know, I'll take the Bible where it seems to conflict with science. And that's one way you can do it. And, and if you're, if you're a non-scientific person, you can actually make that work. Unfortunately, there are people like me who are scientific people and you can't make that work because I use science in my business all the time. And we, we use double-blind placebo-controlled studies. We use, we use DNA sequences. We use, you know, all of this kind of stuff in our daily lives. And we know that it is at least some of the time reliable. And we're being, uh, if I can put it that way, we're being fed a line that says that you have to, you know, the, the standard interpretation has overwhelming evidence. Well, the problem is it's not really overwhelming evidence. We just saw one area where it isn't overwhelming, where in fact, if you look at it on balance, it kind of argues for short age. 
But that is the it argues for creation. And yet that is very technical stuff that the average person is not going to... Well, you're, you're correct. The problem is that we have people in this room and we'll have people looking on video eventually yeah. who will know enough about this that they will say, um, oh, I understand what, uh, you know, what the evidence is. I understand how it fits together. And that's one of the reasons why, in addition to just telling you stuff, I'm putting those, um, uh, those references up and um, uh, Jeff is putting them in a side um, thing so that you can just click on them. Um, and you know, hopefully they'll last long enough so that people can do that. If not, they can do Google searches like I did. But at least they'll know what they're looking for so that they can look at the papers and they can see if they fit. And they can see if there are other papers that agree with or contradict them. And, and it gives them, because I have to speak to them too. And the truth of the matter is, I have to speak to them more even than the people who, uh, you know, are kind of, oh, it's science and, oh, uh, Because okay, they're the that's ones, what they say. They're Those the ones feeding the wrong information to exactly. people. Exactly. They're the ones, uh, you've got to reach the top of the food chain as well as the bottom, you know. Uh, I mean, it's, and that's why, I'm, that's why I'm trying to do it this way is because I think it is important. It is really important for us to realize that for all of us, including the people who deal with science, that, that, that if the pronouncements are there in the textbooks, you don't have to believe them. Even if the pronouncements are there in the, in the peer-reviewed literature, as we saw three weeks ago, you don't necessarily have to believe them. You, you, you're going to have to look at it for yourself. And that's why you know, your personal experience counts. And this is one of the things that um, that scientists or scientists, people who are believe in scientism, yeah. don't want you to do. They don't want you to use your own personal experience, because you see, they want to be the the purveyors of all knowledge. So if they say it, you believe it, and that settles it. To well, paraphrase a certain uh, <laughs> bumper sticker. I, th I think it's nice nice to see that people believe in an accidental miracle for the origin of life, don't understand it either. Well, that's true. And th this is an important thing. This is a really important thing. You see, your personal experience counts. I, I don't care you how many scientists tell you the sky is pink during the middle of the day when the clouds are not <laughs> in. I don't care how many scientists tell you. You go out there and look, and it's blue. And you believe that, and if they try to tell you that the sky is pink, they're full of it. If, if they try to tell you why the sky is blue, then you can believe them, maybe. And, you know, the more they say that fits with what you know, and with fits, you know, if they say, well, you know, if you try this experiment, the whole idea is you go and try that experiment, or you find somebody else who does, and if everybody who tries the experiment gets the same results, well, they're probably right, and you can probably, you know, relax on that. Well, I, th uh, I think our, our science uh, and the place where all this originated and came from wouldn't even think of our science as being science. Yeah. Just stupidity. But see, that's, it's a really important point. Your experience counts for something. Don't ever let anybody tell you it doesn't. Yeah. In fact, all of scientific experiments are in fact experiences one at a time, five at a time, 20 at a time. I did this assay and this is how it came out. I did it trying this, I did it trying this, I did it trying that. That's all personal experience. I think even a lay person can get something from, from this kind of presentation to start saying, well, you know, maybe even if we, we get the bottom line. Yeah. I, th I think that you can get the bottom line. Even if you don't understand all of it, you can. You're, you're exactly right. And the people, and I'm trying to do it so that the people who do understand all those other lines also get that too, because that's important. Yeah, I'm thinking in terms of how is God going to reach the, uh, how do you say, the person on the street 
the one who does not understand science. And on top of that, the fact that the person who is predicted to, that the whole world will follow him, the Pope, he believes in evolution. Yeah. He talks about God, but he mm -hmm. re believes in evolution. Mm -hmm. So how is God going to reach the common individual like myself? I, to be frank, I understand zero except what you said, except the comments at the end regarding evolution and so on. So I don't understand this language. And the common individual is similar to me, to myself. Well, as long as we have people at the top who are honest enough to admit when the literature happens to make a point, that that's what the point, that the point that the literature is making, then I think we have hope. If they want to just lie their teeth out, then the only thing you can do is check it out and find out they're lying. And then, um, and then you just have to discount what they say. That's just all there is to it. Uh, the reason I'm uh, thinking uh, this way is the fact that uh, there's been many articles right now following the the Pope's visit to the U.S. Mm -hmm. saying that saying that uh, this is predicted and we are close to the end. The Sunday Law is again, you know, trying to be. Uh, they they are trying to. Uh, the Pope is trying to. Uh, how do you say? To impose the Sunday Law, not just on uh, certain people, but the entire world. I would be careful about saying that, and I'll tell you why. Is because I haven't seen anybody actually quoting the Pope that said that's his agenda. Now, that doesn't mean it isn't, but it does mean that it is not obvious at present, and I think that we have to be careful about saying wolf too fast uh, when the wolf isn't actually there yet. Uh, one can predict that authoritarian regimes, and uh, the Catholic Church is an authoritarian regime, yeah. will inevitably gravitate towards that. One can say that even if the Pope has no intention of doing it now, it may happen later. But I think we want to be really careful about saying, well, it's going to happen, it's happening right now, and so can't you see? Because if they can't see, you lose them. Well, I did read a reference to what the Pope said about, about Sunday uh, uh, observance. Would you mind uh, bringing uh, the reference so that we can I can try to find it because I don't... You can email it to me. I've got, I, you can have my email address. You can find that, you know, because, because if you can show that, in fact, the Pope is saying this now, then that's a whole lot different from, uh, there's lots of people who are going around right now yelling and screaming and saying, uh, this is, you know, this is nearing the end and, you know, been, people, you know, people of, after a while start writing that off. There are a lot of predictions well, and they uh, haven't come true. That's right. There's a lot, a lot of, of predictions. Lot of to Don't get me month. wrong. I'm, I, I'm, I believe that it's entirely reasonable that that will happen. Uh, the, uh, I'm not sure the source because uh, I've uh, read so much stuff okay. this week. Get the, I will get try the to locate, we'll but I, I cannot guarantee. Okay? 